Hello and welcome. My name is Alana Gordon. I'm a reporter at The World covering global health. This is a live Q&A about the coronavirus pandemic and the mental health impacts of reopening society. Um, my window is open. Apologies for the background noise as it's very <laughs> hot in my apartment. Um, joining me is Kirsten Conan, a professor of psychiatric epidemiology at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Kirsten, this is, I think, our third conversation in this, pan in this pandemic. So thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you. Nice to speak with you again, Alana. Um, and I'm really looking forward to it. And for everyone tuning in, you can uh, post questions for us on Facebook at Forum HSPH, or you can email them to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. This Q&A is jointly presented by the Forum at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the world from PRX and GBH. Kirsten, the pandemic's affected nearly every aspect of how we live, how we work, how we play. Some impacts have been visible, mask wearing, social distancing, but many things aren't like the psychological toll. In the US, we've moved from fearing a virus that has left more than 600,000 people dead to having a vaccination and campaigns that provide some hope um, that we might return to some sense of pre-pandemic normalcy, at least in this country right now, of course, the global rollout is a different story. So to begin um, with this conversation about the mental health impacts of the pandemic and reopening of society, are we fooling ourselves right now as we try to move into this post-pandemic <laughs> phase right now? How are you viewing this given your lens of looking and studying at mental health? Well, thank you for the question and for covering this. Um, I think one, one thing I, from my personal point of view, it's been really, um, I've studied mental health and, and trauma and post-traumatic stress my, you know, my whole career, but it's such a different experience studying the thing that you are living through yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of it, you know, through my own experience as well as research. Um, I guess the, the way I like to think about this time when you say, are we fooling ourselves is that um, we're all, we've all gone through a tremendous amount of change and stress this past year um, with um, you know, locked, all the things you mentioned and lockdowns and changes in the way we work, live every aspect of our lives. Um, and now we're being asked to change back. People are being told to have been home. You need, you have to go back to work. Often there was recent, recent, many companies have recent days set. Even people who had to work through this out of their home the whole time, other aspects of their lives have changed um, in terms of whether it's around seeing family members or other kinds of activities or things that their kids are doing. So it's a time of tremendous change and it's good to remind ourselves that all change is stressful. Mm. So even in what I call the, you know, the uh, prior time before COVID, just things like, you know, getting married or buying your dream home or if you've ever, uh, had, you know, moved to a new job that you're excited about, even those things are tremendously stressful. So um, it's not about, about so much fooling ourselves. It's just being aware that we are going through all these changes and we'll, it'll impact all of us differently, but um, we all will experience some kind of stress um, on top of what we've already experienced this past I guess 16 months now. So this is a stressful moment. A stressful moment, yes. <laughs> um, Even if it's a good moment, it's a stressful moment. Is it a momentary stressful moment? That's a good question. I think, uh, no, I think it will, the, the change, because we've been um, in, you know, experiencing COVID for what are 16, 17 months, depending on what part of in Massachusetts has definitely been since early March. Um, and we've sort of adapted in whatever way we, you know, we have, um, it's gonna take time to get back. So mm -hmm. I would expect it to be um, sort of the change and the stress will last. So for example, because now we're in the summer months, but we'll be transitioning back to school, which will be another, for example, for kids. And that will be another, all the schools are facing, well, what do we do? We're in a different period. How do we change things? Which means there'll be changes on parent, kids and parents and teachers and, um, so that's just one example of how this will be ongoing. Workplaces have adapted and are trying to figure out what to do. Camps, um, you know, families planning get together. So I think it's not something we can turn around overnight for sure. Mm -hmm. I want to ask about kids actually to kick things off. Um, children and adolescents have experienced um, really specific challenges during the pandemic, 
as you were saying, from school closures to a loss of play and social time. Um, a recent brief from the Kaiser Family Foundation found that more than a quarter of high school students reported worsened emotional and cognitive health during the pandemic, and that LGBTQ youth and children mm. of color may be particularly vulnerable. How do we help people and children in particular? And how has your understanding of these impacts evolved over the pandemic? That's a great question. Um, and I wish I had all the, you know, all the answers, but, oh, um, <laughs> but um, so a couple of things we've learned over the pandemic is while sort of we were very focused, which made sense, and in public health and elsewhere on the on the virus and protecting ourselves from the virus in different ways, whether you know it's wearing a mask or staying home and the beginning of you know, disinfecting everything. Um, the in terms of people's mental health, what people report the biggest impact are things like the other stressors or experiences, which are almost like the second secondary to the virus. So, virus. so it can be things like exactly like you said, schools being closed. Um, you know, changes in economic circumstances, um, you know, changes in, um, you know, other, uh, like childcare for parents and things like that. Um, and I think that is something, you know, similarly, that's true for kids. I think as much as um, education has really tried to step up and offer online and tried to adapt, I think what we've learned is there's really no replacing um, in-person in in -person contact between kids and kids and, and teachers. And that, um, you know, in many places, especially our public schools were inadequately resourced to really meet all the challenges. And um, it's not, I don't have all the answers in how we can address this, but one thing I think we have to be careful of is we, one can't ignore it and just sort of pretend like, um, you know, pretend like kids haven't been affected. And that mm -hmm. if, um, if, you know, even if, the older kids are vaccinated, that everything's fine. And the other thing is we can't just expect the um, schools to deal with kids' mental health without additional resources to do so. Um, and um, nor leave it to just to parents to sort out. So one would expect increased need for sort of special education um, services and things on the learning side, but also what are the, what is, what's available on the social emotional side for supporting kids and parents. And that differs from school and district, but um, you know, it, it's gonna, there's gonna be a big need that has to be addressed for sure. Mm. I wanna, um, as we're having this kind of general part of the conversation yeah. and many questions have come in okay. from listeners already, but um, just moving to adults, um, there's been reports of lots of people leaving their jobs mm -hmm. about health workers, especially burning out from all of this. Um, what are we learning about the pandemic's impact on work and how that breaks down? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, one of the things we're learning is that there are, especially we've noticed in, in healthcare, people burned out and feeling um, um, part of burnout or in general feeling um, perhaps betrayed by institutions they work for unappreciated um, on, you know, whether it's whether financially or just that they weren't, their, their contributions weren't acknowledged. Um, or, and people also reevaluating work in terms of maybe that job wasn't worth an hour and a half commute each way, or um, I want to spend, you know, more time with my family or things like that. And, um, so it's really causing people to reevaluate work, which, um, you know, for some people can be a good thing. Um, but I think at the institutional side, employers need to think about, institutions need to think about how to address some of these issues. And one is that um, people are going to have to trans, so in terms of going back to work, whatever you're, if you're transitioning back, in terms of transition, um, institutions are going to have to deal with the challenges employees face. And then I think around burnout, um, how can institutions, for example, are there policies, and I'm not an employment policy expert, but are there policies that can allow people to have adjusted schedules or leave time or um, allow people to keep their jobs, but recover if they are burned out um, or have time to transition back to new expectations? And I think that, um, you know, we've learned during the pandemic, something that's been positive is a lot of things we said we never could do have been done. Just in, for example, in mental health care, um, 
people have been trying for years to get reimbursement for telehealth, equal mm. reimbursement for telehealth. That, people have been trying to do that for years. Couldn't be done, couldn't be done. Then suddenly overnight, you know, with, with executive orders, you know, at the state level, it's telehealth reimbursed. Um, it's been incredibly successful. Um, there's a lot of evidence that for mental health services can be provided through telehealth effectively. So I'm sure there's many other things that workplaces and people have done that have worked. And I, I think it's time, maybe we can take this transition time to think about, well, what changes, what are the things that we thought couldn't be done that we've done and that have been successful? And maybe there are changes in workplaces. I think a lot of workplaces are thinking about more flexible schedules, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so things that can be done going forward. Um, but I would, I, one thing I wanna be careful is to put this on the institutions and not just tell people, you know, you're burned out, go take care of yourself, but you still have to, you know, work 12 hour shifts <laughs> five days a week. I, I, it makes me think of places like Spain that are trying four day work weeks as an right. example. Right, um, right. Which leads me to one thing I wanted to ask before we really dig into um, viewer questions and listener questions, which is uh, you're a global health researcher mm -hmm. on um, uh, the pandemic on, and in particular on pregnant and postpartum mm -hmm. women and how the pandemic is impacting uh, post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. Sorry about the background. <laughs> um, depression and anxiety um, and other issues around the pandemic. Could you... Yeah, tell us about what you found with that, what you're learning about the pandemic and particularly impacts on women and right. pregnant postpartum women. Sure. Um, I was lucky with colleagues, a colleague, um, Diego Wazinski from Pregistry um, and a colleague from Harvard Chan, uh, Sonia Hernandez Diaz, to do a survey of um, pregnant and postpartum women globally and on their mental health and well being and what was on their mind. And I think the thing that was most striking um, to me was that um, the women wrote in comments, um, which caused us to change the survey. Um, and the comments were a lot about the other stressors they were experiencing in addition to COVID. So the things that we found most associated with their mental health um, uh, in depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, and also loneliness were economic challenges and challenges with childcare. And then also because for pregnant women, um, shutdowns around healthcare were also very stressful. So not being able to go, there was lots of changes around healthcare and pre prenatal care and even pregnancy, birth and delivery. And so it really kind of spoke to the broad range of effects of COVID, but also the need for policies to address sort of economic security, childcare, and again, you know, adjustments in healthcare that need to be made because of the virus, mm. but how that might impact women's mental health, not being able to go to your regular prenatal checkups, for example, and not having a partner at delivery. Um, and, um, you know, those were very distressing for women. The other thing that was really striking and having done work in global mental health my whole career, I've never experienced this before. It was how, how similar the problems when we were reporting across the different countries. So we had um, 64 countries represented, but the countries with the most participants were the US, Mexico, South Africa, and China. So those are you know, obviously very different, but the things that women were writing about were very similar. And also their um, level of distress was very mm. similar. So um, that was really striking because usually when you study something, I study uh, earthquake in Mexico, you're studying something that happened in one context, but mm -hmm. in this case, it really captured the global experience of COVID. You mentioned a little bit about structural. It makes me think back to an earlier conversation yeah. that we had about um, kind of the intersections also of mental health and some of the structural and even policies that governments and communities can be thinking about. Um, in, and, and you had mentioned employers earlier. Mm -hmm. um, what, are you, what are you seeing when it comes to these sorts of things? Um, well, the exciting part is you're seeing a lot of innovation. I think that um, I see, um, uh, you know, so at the, at the employer level, there's lots of employers doing surveys of employees and really trying to figure out um, employers that would have said there was no option ever to work at home or thing, to figure out what, you know, how it can work, what people want, how to reimagine workspaces and things like that. 
And then I see um, there's been a lot of great state level work on policies around, again, some of the things in Massachusetts have been around reimbursement for telehealth. Um, but I was talking to a group in Indiana who did, um, got funding for crisis lines. Mm -hmm. So I think there's been um, a lot of um, local and state level innovation and you know, what, what I personally would like to see is more leadership at the federal level to make mental health and the mental health effects of COVID a priority at the same level as um, concerns about variants or other aspects of the virus, because um, I really do think it needs that national leadership as well as all the, all the leadership we have seen at the state level. So there has been a lot of innovation and it'll be really interesting to see how if people can carry that through in the, you know, in the, hopefully post-pandemic times. This, uh, it might be a good transition into this question from Lexi. Um, there's a ton of really great questions here from um, viewers. I know I keep alluding to that. Some of them you've been getting at, but um, what stresses or mental health impacts might be associated with those who are unemployed, mm -hmm. um, especially as unemployment bonuses run out soon? Yeah, so we actually know, I did some work and other people did work too during the um, 2008 Great Recession, which showed that things like, for example, we found that home foreclosures, people who had foreclosed homes had increased risk of, of even if they never had anxiety or depression before having an anxiety disorder or depression. Um, so economic stressors, we know, impact mental health, whether it's, um, losing income of some sort um, or losing your home. Um, and um, so we never, we don't usually frame it like this, but policies that um, provide economic security and stability and, in, and make those investments are actually good for mental health and could be seen as mental health interventions mm -hmm. um, because it's, um, we just, we, there's just such a direct link as, as you can imagine the stress from not losing your job. And then it has all these downstream effects, stress of parents of losing the jo their jobs then affects their kids, um, which then probably affects their kids' mental health. So it's, it, it, there is this um, very strong connection that we often don't think about when we think of you know, economic interventions or economic policies. Are you saying we often don't think about it, but we we should? We should, so yes, we yes, we should. More. I think of I think of um, I think of economic policies. They they can be thought of as mental health um, policies, as policies to affect mental health or improve mental health. But uh, this question comes from Mark. Uh, what actions are in place to quote pick up the pieces in this mm. crisis? For example, will there be mass public education or treatment? <laughs> That's a good question, Mark. I think, um, so So part of that is why I would like to see more um, leadership. And there, ha there has been some, but really um, public leadership at the federal level. Um, I would love to see the appointment, like we have a, a, sort of a climate czar, a science czar, mental health czar, whatever you call it, um, who could investigate and maybe provide some national leadership on these policies in terms of, where I've seen leadership is at the state and local level. Some of the things I've mentioned with states setting up um, crisis lines, um, setting up, um, um, you know, making changes to policies to increase availability of services. Um, also, uh, and, and employers doing that, employers have offered that, but it, it, it's um, a little bit left to the individuals and the communities and whatever institutions they're attached to. So that's why it would be great to see more leadership at the national level for some of the things like Mark mentioned. Um, I think public education, um, not everyone needs, it's it, even if people are distressed, they may, they may not need you know, mental health treatment, but there may be other supports that could be provided that would improve their mental health. Um, this question comes from Ian. It's about the Delta variant, which is mm. circulating. Um, we've been hearing that we may be asked to start wearing masks again. Mm. I know this is an issue, for example, in messaging in LA. Um, of course, globally, the situation is different as well. Um, so how do you deal with feeling like we turned a corner and then to have something switch or go backwards, potentially? It's, yeah, it's really hard. <laughs> um, it's really hard. I think that... Um, that something, 
so so one of the reasons this year has been really hard on mental health or one of the one of the many reasons is that you know uncertainty and uncontrollability and threats which we've all experienced with covid are really tough on mental health um, we like to feel like we're in control. We like to feel like we can predict the future. Um, and we kind of all operate like that in our lives. Um, and I think with the challenges um, that we all are gonna need to live with a certain amount of uncertainty. Mm. And um, that is, um, that's okay, we can. We actually do all the time. We just don't realize we do. Um, and, um, something to remind ourselves of and from a more hopeful point of view is that we've, you know, we've made it through the last year um, and we've all dealt with a lot of uncertainty and a lot of messages, you know, wear, don't wear a mask, wear a mask. Uh, you know, you can go outside, you can't go, you can, you can do this, you can do that. Um, and so what we hope is that the messaging will be more clear going forward um, and that um, we can, you know, we, we can adapt, we have adapted and we can adapt. But I think, I think we will have to tolerate a good amount of uncertainty. And as you said, globally, um, globally there'll be challenges for quite a while, which means there may be other variants and things like that. So um, I think it's, it's just gonna be challenging. That's, and accepting that. And accepting that, which is uh, not easy. As someone personally who likes to be in control and plan the future, it's not easy. I just want to remind everyone who's tuning in that I'm Alana Gordon, a reporter with The World, and I'm speaking with Kirsten Conan, a psychiatric epidemiologist at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and we're taking your questions, so um, viewers, if you want to post them. Um, this question comes from Lori. It seems to me that the pandemic has, on the one hand, reinforced bonds within communities, Every time I ask a question, the subway goes by, I apologize. Um, <laughs> That's true. I don't know if it's as loud to you as it is. Yeah, it's okay. Um, uh, okay. Sorry, Lori. Uh, it seems to me that the pandemic has, on the one hand, reinforced bonds within communities, but at the same time pushed strangers further apart. Is there mm -hmm. any data to support my premise? Like, I found that when I go farther than a few miles from my town, I'm swallowed in a weird depression. I've reasoned mm -hmm. comes from an unsafe feeling. Oh, wow. That's a beautiful, uh, Lori's a poet, actually. Um, freelance journalist. Freelance <laughs> writer. So, um, yeah, I think the pandemic has had, um, has challenged in, in closeness and pushing people to part in and, with, in, in and outside communities. And um, I, have a, I have a lot of thoughts with this, but I'll try to be brief. One is that um, it's normal when we're under threat to kind of hunker down and sort of attach to people closest to us, which, you know, may be your, your family or your building or, you know, you know people, your neighbors um, where I live. And um, that is really self-protective and it's almost how we evolve as humans, um, how we evolved. But um, um, so I would say that is kind of expected that now after hunkering down, when you go outside that, it feels it can feel threatening. Um, and myself, I think um, I mentioned when we were talking that there's also some, there also can be just some um, unease and almost like grief or sadness because maybe because things that were normal don't feel normal or don't feel the same. So maybe you used to go out to this community, something you enjoy doing a couple times a year, and now it just feels strange or it doesn't feel like you thought it would. Um, and so that is also just, that, I, that just would be expected to deal with. Um, so I think that's part of all the changes that we're all going through right now. So learning more about this as we all experience it as well. Right, it sounds right, like. exactly, yeah, yes. This question comes from Beth and following up about schools. Um, mm -hmm. Looking ahead to next year, what should schools be doing now to prepare to meet students' mental health needs in the fall? Wow, that's a great question. Probably should have a whole, we could have a whole forum, I think, on kids' mental health and schools, maybe. Um, I have, yeah, that would be a whole. So I guess briefly, I think, on one thing, I hope all teachers 
and school administrators are getting some time off this summer. So I just have to say that because I think it's been a tremendous stressor on teachers this past year, um, having many friends who are teachers and things like that. So what can schools um, do in the fall? I think um, that one is around educating themselves and they're, you know, as part of their, you know, whatever they do, summer education or teacher development, including some understanding of, of mental health for students, um, but also around, particularly around changes in stress and what are some common, depending on the age group of kids that you have in your classroom, what are some common ways that, that kids express um, stress or resistance to change or having challenges with change? So that just so teachers and folks in the school are um, prepared for, um, kid, for how kids might come back, which might be which is going to be very different. Some school systems um, where my sister lives upstate New York, it's been open the entire last year. And uh, my nephew's been in school all last year, and he, I expect very little transition in the fall. Well, some kids haven't been in school. And so depending on the situation, really, I mean, I would say preparing teachers just to be aware of what they might see. Um, and then also collecting information on resources, like where they can refer families in the community, whether it's community mental health services, et cetera. So what are those resources? So they're well connected. And a lot of schools, at least where I live, a lot of schools are connected, but making sure you're kind of update on those connections and you can make those for parents. Um, and then I would like to see this as a challenge for you know, what could schools be doing better in the future with kids' mental health? Um, um, you know, how might we, might we want to prepare better for future crises like this? But that is, I think that's a longer term question. Mm -hmm. um, this question is, I, I want to get, yeah. you know, we're running out of time, but oh, there's no, no. other good questions. I, I wonder if you have a couple more minutes or if you have- oh, Yeah, yeah, so I can stay late. It's fine. Okay, though. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, keep going. So, um, and I'm taking in what you just said, but there's just so many really good yeah. questions. Um, this one's from Andrew. Pandemic related isolation has been uh, especially mm. hard on many people who are older. Yes. Um, is there research on mental health impacts of the pandemic on older adults in particular and how to provide effective support as society reopens to these individuals? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that's been really striking is when folks have compared older adults to younger adults is that actually younger folks seem to be having worse mental health effects. And um, it's, a, it's a complicated thing to research, which I won't bore everyone with that, those details, but that actually surprised me and we find that in our own work. Um, Wait, how do you define older adults? So I'm so in those studies where maybe report usually they look like 65 and over 70 and over versus you know folks in like their 20s or something 30s. Um, so I know I'm um, my my 14 year old thinks I'm an older adult now. So so um, it, it, it depends on definition. But at the same time, um, older adults were obviously more at risk of getting very sick or dying from the virus disproportionately. Um, you know, soft usually friends or people they knew died. Um, and um, we're also, you know, from my own experience with my mom who lived in Atlanta, we're disproportionately locked down. So even though where she lived had opened up, her building and everything was locked down. So um, I think that, um, you know, what, you know, where things have been effective is that there's been a lot of efforts to introduce um, Te technology, two things. One is getting vaccines to older adults and, you know, protecting them s as quick as possible. That was, um, I think that effort was quite, has been quite successful. So affecting their physical, protecting their physical health so they could actually go out in the world. And then all kinds of innovations around technology. We actually have a program I found out in Brookline, which is um, now matching young people to volunteer to help uh, older adults with technology. This is happening this past year. So, so to increase those connections and then things that would take care of other needs like getting food, like um, meals on wheels and things like how could you adjust that during the pandemic? So that's another area where I think there actually were a lot of things done that people would have said were not possible prior to the pandemic. And some of those we might want to continue going forward. Mm -hmm. um, so this is comes, I wanna combine two questions here. Um, 
kind of unfairly, but one is from Don, which is that we've entered into phase three at my office. And mm-hmm. every time I pull into the parking lot, I hyperventilate. Mm-hmm. How do we adjust to being back? So there's a question about anxiety in that transition. And then this question comes from Jill. Do you have suggestions for people who really are quite happy to be isolated during the pandemic mm-hmm. and are now reluctant to have to pretend that they're overjoyed to return to social situations <laughs> or to work? Shout out well, to Jill. Yeah, to, uh, I would say, um, you know, Jill, you're not alone. I was telling Alana before that I, I had friends call me, you call me and be, is there something wrong with me? Because, you know, I'm not overjoyed. And, and some are just reporting feeling very stressed about the changes. Um, and some people, um, um, you know, the pandemic, especially people were very anxious or socially anxious, the pandemic provided a, um, a way of basically avoiding or getting out of many things that you might have found distressing. Now, it could have been that going into your office or it might have been that, you know, you know, you didn't like seeing your family every, you know, having your family dinner every month and now you have to again. And so there, and so um, that is, so those are real things people are facing. And then, um, and, and then Don talking about feeling like the level of panic. So I, I think a couple of things is um, one is that, you know, feeling anxiety after not doing something or avoiding something for this, as long as we have 16, 17 months, that's, that is normal for everyone. Um, the real issue is if the anxiety is getting in the way of things you actually want to do. So if the pandemic allowed you to get out of some things that you no longer want to do, that might be something you want to look at for yourself if you can. It may be, there may be changes in your life. We talk about people who are willingly changing jobs or some people are reevaluating. They're like, they were, you know, a lot of parents I know said, you don't want to go back to running around all the time like a crazy person. Um, so thinking about that, but if there are things that you, you do want to be doing, but now you're anxious, then that is something, um, you know, that is a whole, another thing you can work on. So some of the um, one that, that could be a whole session in itself. But one of the things is that um, there are a lot of strategies you can use. You can find them online. You don't necessarily need a therapist to teach you that can help with sort of the level of panic that Don's experiencing. There's something called diaphragmatic breathing. Um, and maybe we can post some resources or something afterwards that can help with those feelings of panic. That specific situation, is, you, can, you can learn to manage that. And then the other piece is avoidance really reinforces anxiety. So if you're someone who, you know, you do wanna socialize, but you're feeling anxious about it, think of ways that you can um, get yourself to do it that will not be overwhelming. So some of the suggestions I've given to people, like people are invited to a party, they feel anxious, they haven't been to a party in 17 months. Um, you know, can you, you know, make a deal with yourself to go for a short time? Can you bring a friend to the party? Can you, you know, are there things you can do to make these things less anxiety provoking? So you can kind of just slowly reintegrate yourself. So those are some, you know, those, I could go on about that because I think about that a lot, but. If you, I, I, I could go on listening. Is there, are there <laughs> do you have other thoughts on that? I'm sure that. Um, yeah, I think that social, I mean, one of the most common questions I get from people emailing me or calling me in media is around this social anxiety and people um, feeling anxious about going out and doing things they used to do. And I think that other things, um, you know, and there's some of the anxiety is around the virus, but it often goes beyond that. And it's really about like, you know, avoiding situations that are stressful. So I think anything you can, so one, so a couple of things is one, anything you can do to reduce your baseline stress and anxiety level will help. So some of the things, so for example, if I know I'm going to give a talk that's making me anxious I make sure I go for a run or try to work out earlier in the day because that will kind of just reduce my stress level. And then when I go into the talk, even if I get anxious, I won't get as anxious. So doing all those kinds of things that take care of yourself. But then, like I said, the other things is getting support and things you can kind of um, reintroduce yourself to things in a slower fashion. So you don't have to go from being home all the time to going to like some huge party. You know, maybe the first step for you is like, meeting a friend out or meeting a couple of friends or going to, you know, just, um, you know, going to uh, like your neighbor's barbecue or, um, you know, doing something that feels a little easier 
um, and starting slowly. And then you can kind of work yourself up to these bigger situations. Jennifer, and, and you re- referenced this a little bit, the yeah. beginning of our conversation had asked, is there anything, what can employees who are experiencing, what, what can be done to help employees experiencing this in particular anxiety transition in the workplace? Um, I think that that is a great question. Um, some of the things I've thought about are, um, one, having really clear messaging. So uncertainty and just like, com- you know, uncertainty just breeds anxiety. So if you can have really clear messages. Secondly is, um, I think, listen to employees and where you can still get the work done you need to get done, but be flexible Are there ways if people feel like they have more control that will reduce their anxiety? So that may mean for many, many people, I think that means it seems like the overwhelming, you know, majority is something between yes, we'll come back, but I can't go back right away to like, you know, nine to five, five days a week. So where it's possible to listen to employees and make adjustments and allowances do that because if people have a little more control, they will feel less anxious. And then I think if there are things your workplace did that seem to work, like some places offered, um, you know, support groups, some places offered free subscriptions to different apps or different services. Um, see if you can continue those, um, get a sense from your employees, what was helpful to them and don't, um, you know, don't sort of just pull them because we're back. Um, and so I think, I think some of those, some of those things that workplaces did that, um, or try to do have been incredibly effective and it can also be useful in this transition. This question comes from uh, Bryce. Do you think one aspect of the pandemic is that there's an increased compassion for people who have mental health issues? Mm -hmm. Since many people may be experiencing things like depression and anxiety, they may not have felt before. Um, And if you do agree, then how can that compassion and understanding be kept going? Oh, I hope so. That's, I, I don't know. I hope so. I remember, um, I think it was last summer. Um, I think it was Mich- last summer, Michelle Obama said in a podcast about how she was, or an interview where she was experiencing a low level depression. And I don't, my email blew up that day. I saw it posted on, you know, news. And I think that, um, that kind of showed me how, um, having, just having p- p- people talk about their experience you know, especially prominent people, influential people can really um, give permission to, for people to share about how they're feeling. So I do think that it's definitely raised awareness and I hope it's increased compassion and how we can, that's a good question about how we keep going. I think one of the ways we can keep, um, keep it going is continuing to, to have, um, to sort of, not sweep it under the rug now that we, you know, if, if we, if we're in, if we're in post pandemic world, not sweep, you know, all, all of what we're experiencing under the rug and especially having keep coming back to national leadership, but it really does help to have people who are in, you know, influential positions, whether in, in uh, policy, but, or in, in, in a, you know, social media sense, talk about their struggles that does give permission for the rest of us to talk about it. So I think that that is a positive and I hope to see that continue. Do you have time for a few more questions? Yeah, sure. Let's, Let's okay. keep going. All right. <laughs> uh, this question's from uh, Gita. Do you think that the pandemic will cause people to lead more of their lives socially and professionally online versus in mm. person? And what might be the health, mental health consequences of that? Have you been... Uh looking at that? Yeah, I mean, the people have been looking at that. I think we'll see. I mean, in our, um, in our global survey of pregnant and postpartum women, we found something that's been pretty common, which is that um, there is an association between feeling more depressed or anxious and a high level of media exposure, whether it's news, social media, just, um, and that, so that can be, that's, that's, you know, that's one aspect of living lives online versus the sort of, you know, zooming or connecting. Um, so I think, I, I actually think that, that there'll be, um, there'll be some positives in that uh, the 
facility with Zoom and, and or whatever different online platforms has enabled us to connect. I mean, I've connected with all friends, connect globally more easily, made it more kind of normative. And so I think that's some positives. I think that, um, but I also think people are, it, it's shown people the limits of it and um, people are craving that in-person contact. So I don't know that we will, um, you know, it will shift to where people want to live more of their lives online. I think that um, actually it's shown people that they actually want to kind of connect in person, and things like that. Um, I think we'll, we'll, it'll be something we'll learn a lot about that over the next year um, as people study how, how that, how living this virtual life has affected, you know, many of us. This uh, transitions and I'll, I'll wrap up shortly. Um, from Jamie, and then I want to follow up with a question from Jack. How well does virtual services for things like mental health issues mm -hmm. work? Uh, for example, uh, accessing therapy and mental mm -hmm. health online. Um, and there's a follow up from Jack, but I'll start with that. Yeah, sure. So because it's different, but it's it is different. Accessible. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. So there actually has been um, there's been quite a few studies prior to the pandemic on um, whether virtual mental health services or equivalent to in-person for specific treatments for specific disorders. I'm familiar with those for post-traumatic stress disorders because what I study. And actually the evidence is that for many treatments, it can, virtual can be provided as well as in-person um, for when they looked at specific kinds of treatments. So a lot of that, you know, surprisingly, I want to give credit, is led out of the Department of Veterans Affairs. There's been a lot of research out of that uh, Boston um, National Center for PTSD and Boston colleagues there um, give the give them credit because because in the VA which is sort of you know its own healthcare system there's been a big push to reach veterans who live in rural areas and can't could never access services in person so to increase that access they actually studied it and found that so there is a lot of it doesn't mean it's it's not for every disorder and every problem it's not a perfect perfectly um, equivalent. But for many, many things, it is equivalent. And there is some evidence that people um, come more if they have a virtual option, because especially for parents or children or young people, because they can, they, all the logistics of getting to an appointment. Mm. You don't have that. You don't have that. You know, you think of, you know, I, live in, I live in an area where there's therapists everywhere. But if you think if you have to drive an hour each way, you have to drive, you have to park. And, you know, a 45 minute therapy appointment becomes two hours between the logistics. So, um, so I think there's lots of positives that about that. This leads pretty well into uh, Jack's question. Many people are trying to get time with a therapist mm -hmm. who are, yeah. are finding it's super hard and therapists yes. are books. Yes. Are there enough mental health providers to meet the demand? And if not, what can be done to bridge the gap? This was obviously a problem well before the pandemic, yes. but... <laughs> Yes, it's been made. I mean, I know because I, for family members, but also just people contact me for referrals and mm. every, pretty much every provider I know of or have contact with, especially those for kids, are not only full, but their wait lists are full. Many, many providers are not, um, are, have closed their wait lists. So I, I, even, I live in a place where there's a lot of providers. So I think we know the answer that there aren't there aren't enough, particularly enough that take any kind of insurance or are affordable. Um, I'm talking about people who might not even take insurance and are you know have high have you know market level fees. So um, even at that level, if you can just pay out of pocket and you're just willing to pay, it's um, it's people aren't available. So mm -hmm. I think there aren't enough professionals. I think in terms of what we can do, there's some practical policy things. One thing is that um, people have talked about is allowing people to provide services uh, through telehealth across state lines. So that um, right now, the way insurance works and licensing works, like I'm licensed in Massachusetts, I cannot provide services, even though I li like if someone in I don't know, in Pennsylvania, I wanted services for me. I could not provide them, even if logistically it was possible over telehealth. So there's, there's, there's challenges to licensing and reimbursement that might help with some of this. Um, and then the other piece is that um, really is, you know, we had a mental health care crisis before the pandemic. 
So I, I have wondered if some of the models that have worked in other countries and contexts, like where I work in um, low income settings where, um, you know, there are effective treatments and services that could be provided with people who don't have, you know, a master's in social work or an MD or a PhD. And, you know, are there ways to implement those better so that there's more providers, um, which is, it's, it's uh, something that is done in other contexts um, in other parts of the world a lot, whether we could do something more like that here, whether we could look at things like, you know, peer supports or, you know, are there services that could be provided through, through churches or other community organizations, which might be different. I'm not talking about someone who needs like, you know, a specific medication that might need to see a psychiatrist, but many of the things that are effective for mental health, um, you know, could be potentially provided in, by people without this, you know, extensive graduate training. So, hmm. but they wouldn't be reimbursed by insurance at, at this point. So there's, there's complexity there too. Sorry. No, no. I'm sorry to cut you off. Um, <laughs> thank you for taking all these questions and running over. I just thought oh, yeah, of course. Uh, to wrap up, um, as we think about this time in this kind of reopening transition in the US, globally, a more complex picture, what are your big takeaways right now? Your big kind of um, things, uh, tools moving into this uncertain time mm -hmm. and, and also questions that you have looking ahead? Oh, my big, <laughs> my big takeaways um, are, um, I mean, I'm wondering, I, I have the same, you know, concerns and uncertain, you know, facing the same uncertainty as everyone else, whether it's what school going to look like for my son, you know, all that kind of thing. Um, so my, my big takeaways are that um, um, it's really been amazing to see all the innovations and the attention to mental health in the past year in the public and the media, um, how mental health professionals and organizations have stepped up the amount of free resources out there. It's almost overwhelming. There's so many free resources. Um, and the conversation around mental health. So that makes me feel incredibly positive that that's not gonna disappear going forward and it offers the opportunity to make real changes. Um, and so um, you know, that's where I'm really hopeful. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that that translates into institutions, um, you know, government and institutions making some policy changes or thinking through policies that'll help improve, that'll improve mental health going forward for everyone. Um, and, um, you know, we can think about, you know, mental health as, I mean, COVID taught us that, you know, the health, my, my neighbor's health and other people's health affects my health how people behave, if people in my community are wearing masks and, and distancing, that can protect my own health. Well, it's the same thing with mental health and if we can think of mental health as something we share as a community and not as something as like, it's just our individual responsibility. Um, you know, I feel hopeful that if we can do that, that will um, bode well going forward. I muted because of the loud subway, but... Um... <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and for taking Thanks everyone's lot, questions. Man. Um, that concludes our discussion. This Q&A has been jointly presented by the forum at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the World from PRX and GBH. You can view the full discussion on the Harvard Chan YouTube channel and on our Facebook pages at Forum HSPH and at PRI the World. I also wanna add um, in this important conversation about mental health that if you or a family member need assistance with a mental health or substance use issue, you can call SAMHSA's National Helpline 1-800-662-4357. There's also the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, Alana. Thanks for, thanks for your questions, everyone.